I'm ready when you are. Okay. We want to say good evening to everyone and welcome to our Juneteenth celebration. Our theme for tonight and throughout the week is dream uh, uh, de justice delayed, justice delayed, our Juneteenth 2021 celebration. I'm sure you've heard uh, the poem by Langston Hughes, which asked the question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Or does it stink like rot rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? He referred to a dream deferred, but what happens when justice is deferred or delayed and delayed someone could say it's justice denied. We're going to examine that throughout this week. We want to start by saying welcome to everyone. And we want to have our uh, Black National Anthem at this time by Anaya Thompson. <laughs> Oh 
say thank you to Anaya Thompson for that wonderful selection of our national anthem. Uh, going into our Juneteenth celebration, we do want to share, as we stated earlier, our theme, Justice Delayed. Juneteenth is one of the oldest known celebrations commemorating the ending of slavery in the United States. Dating back in 1865, it was on June 19 that the Union soldiers, led by Ma Major General Jordan Gordon Granger, landed in Gaveston, Texas, with news that the war had ended and that the enslaved were now free. Note that this was two, approximately two and a half years after the President Lincoln Emancipation Proclamation. The City of Bloomington Human Relations Commission in partnership with the McLean County Historical Society and the Bloomington Normal Black History Project are hosting our 2021 annual Juneteenth celebration. Bloomington Normal held its first Juneteenth celebration back in 1993 with efforts that was led by Dr. Mildred Pratt and others. And it was sponsored by the Bloomington Normal Black History Project. This week, and through Saturday, our goal is to educate, motivate, and celebrate, to explore the history of African Americans and Blacks within their contribution. Our theme all week is justice de uh, de delayed. We invite our entire community to join us and explore the history, our justice system, and ask questions. Finally, to examine where do we go from here? We will hear from our professors, from young adults and our children. Most importantly, we all must pay a role, play a role and be held accountable. Thank you for joining us and we hope that you will enjoy the activities for this evening. We are excited for the professors that we have that will be speaking and we are proud to uh, introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, we do ask that everybody keep your phones and your computers on mute and any questions that you may have to ask of Dr. McDuffie, if you would put it into our chat. And at the end of his presentation, we will allow time for those questions to be asked. And we will have information regarding uh, Dr. McDuffie on our website. You can go to www.bnbhp.com and you can find additional information, not only on our speaker, but other activities throughout the week. Dr. Eric McDuffie is an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies at the University of Illinois, an author and recipient of many awards. Originally from Detroit, Dr. McDuffie is a sixth generation Midwesterner whose family hails from the United States, Canada, and St. Kitts. Encourage you all to read about him in more detail by going to the website. At this time, I am honored to present to you Dr. Eric McDuffie. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Ms. Halbert, for the, uh, for the very kind introduction. Again, my name is Eric McDuffie. I use the pronouns he, his. I am an associate professor of African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, located on the ancestral lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piancasha, Wea, Miami, Meskwatan, Odawa, Sok, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. Before I get started, I'd like to begin with a moment of silence for George Floyd, Micaiah Bryant, Dante Wright, Rakia Boyd. We want to listen to today's 
Juneteenth talk by a U of I African American professor. Here's the website. Anderson today, oh, Yes. Yeah. Someone's uh, mic is not muted. Thank you. Thank you. If we can make sure, if we can make sure everyone is muted, please. Thank you. Again, a moment of silence for all those black uh, and uh, brown, queer, trans, and cis women, men, and children across the Midwest, the United States, and world who were murdered by the police. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Brother Kai Ajayi, Miss Lily Halbert, uh, for the invitation to present at this Juneteenth commemoration sponsored by the Bloomington Human Relations Commission. I also wish to thank Ms. Frances Maddox and organizers of today's events. And why don't we uh, go ahead and get started since time is of the essence. Uh, I, I have a PowerPoint, a uh, multimedia screen uh, presentation for you. I presume everyone can see. Let's make sure this is the right one. Okay, okay good, good, very good. All right, I will give folks a moment to take a look at that first screen. And I should note that I, I'm very, uh, I'm deeply moved um, by the theme of this event, justice delay, that while justice may have been denied, uh, and it has been uh, for centuries, that does not mean that ultimately justice will not be, will not be received, will not be gained, that black people, that we will, that, that we in fact will be free again. And so often, as I say in class, too often we talk about free, going from slavery to freedom. And what we must begin, if we understand the history of African people, the history of African Americans, uh, the, the, the history of the, of the African descendant globally, it's not a history that goes from slavery to freedom. It's a story that begins in freedom and then moves to enslavement, colonialism, what have you, to our current uh, situation. But I am confident that one day we again will be free. That said, and for today, the title of my talk is To Be Human is to be African. To be human is to be African. Africa and the birthplace of humanity and civilization. And I have three uh, overall objectives for today. First and foremost, as, as we just pointed out, that we need to understand that African-American history, Black history, African history, did not begin in slavery. I'll we'll say that again. That African-American history, Black history, the history of African-descended people in this country, the Caribbean, and on the continent, Europe, Asia, Australia, everywhere, did not begin in slavery did not begin in slavery. Rather, it began at the dawn of humanity in Africa. You want to emphasize the importance of, of, of appreciating Africa as the birthplace of humanity and human civilization. And then time permitting, we'll speak briefly about 1619, its historical Significance, of course, we, we acknowledged just two years ago, the 400th anniversary of the approximate uh, 20 uh, uh, Africans who landed at Hampton Roads in uh, Hampton, uh, Virginia. Uh, we'll talk about its historical significance at the end of today. So again, folks, time is of the essence. Ms. Halbert, if you could be so kind, perhaps uh, if you could keep time, you wanna send me through chat, maybe a quick, uh, you know, 15 minutes left, 10 minutes left, because I could talk about this stuff all day. Gotcha, gotcha, because again, I, I dig this stuff. Folks, we're gonna cover about, oh, six million years of human history in about 25 minutes here. So hang on here, and we, again, we've got a good one. 
I think this quote, this passage from the late great St. Clair Drake, a uh, foundational scholar uh, of, Af of Africana studies, uh, made his home uh, for years at Roosevelt University. So again, the importance of Chicago, the importance of Illinois, the importance of the Midwest to black history, not just in this country, but globally. Uh, this, this passage by St. Clair Drake, I think really sums it up. That again, this idea that African people, that Africa is a place without history, that Africa is a, uh, was and is a dark continent, that Africa has had no significant role in the history of, Af of, of, of humanity is absolutely bunk. And uh, essentially um, those ideas emerged in concert with the development of capitalism, the emergence of the Atlantic slave trade, the Atlantic plantation complex. And again, I think you know one of the worst aspects of white supremacy, and, and this is coming from a, a scholar, not only if, or rather from a historian, someone who values knowledge, values history. Of course, not only the physical and, and economic exploitation, the sexual exploitation of black women, black girls, children, men, boys, but the way in which white supremacy has reinvented the past, right? The way in which white supremacy again framed Africa as a place without history. So folks, here we go. Again, Africa, the birthplace of humanity. Africa, the birthplace of civilization. To be human is to be, Af is to be African. Let's go back in time. All right. I'm sure many of you uh, have, have, have heard or have seen this, this, this photograph, uh, or rather this drawing and this photograph of the skeletal remains of Lucy. Uh, just to be clear, just so we're on the same page, hu humanity, modern humans, we first emerged, we first evolved on the continent of Africa. There's no getting around it. There's no, there's no question. There's no uh, maybe Africa, Europe, Asia, there was a simultaneous evolution. No, that, that humanity, we emerged on the continent of Africa. And our, our, our ancestry, the history of hominids, again, uh, 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 the uh, great primates, apes, uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, our closest ancestors, of course, we are hominids. Uh, approximately about six, six and a half, seven million years ago, we saw a major evolutionary change in the uh, development of a hominid species. Um, and the creature that you are looking at, Australopithecus, was an important step um, in the evolutionary history of, of us um, as, a, as a human species. She was not a modern human. She was more ape-like than, than human. And in fact, her, her, her species, Australopithecus afarensis, of course, Australopithecus means southern ape. Afarensis, why she called Afarensis? Because she was found um, in the Afar province of Ethiopia, in Afar, in 1974. Um, on the left is, is an image of what we think she may have uh, looked like. She lived to, to be about the age of 15. And on the right um, is actually a photograph, a photograph of her skeletal remains. Those are her actual bones. She lived about 3.2 million years ago in East, um, in the Horn of Africa. And you might say, well, I don't know, Dr. McDuffie, uh, she, she looks quite ape-like, I'm not so sure. Absolutely, she was more ape-like than human, but take a look at her left hip bone. Take a look at her left hip bone. If you know anything about apes, uh, apes can walk on, on two feet, but they prefer not to. Um, but uh, uh, Lucy and Austral and her species were bipedal. They probably spent as much time in trees as they as they spent on the ground, but she in fact was bipedal and, and her hip bone, which looks a lot like a modern human's hip bone, suggests again that she was bipedal. Don't have a lot of time. Uh, what's fascinating about all this, and I'm certainly happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, it seems that climate change, climate change uh, helped to precipitate this 
evolutionary change. When India slammed into Asia, as you may know, the Himalayas are the uh, tallest mountains on the planet, but they're also the youngest mountains on the planet. They, they slammed into Asia as they still are, thrusting India up six, approximately uh, six miles up, which changed global weather patterns, which dried out East Africa, dr dried out the Sahara, which only six or seven million uh, years ago was quite lush. And it forced uh, these apes that were in trees, it forced them uh, to the ground to survive. So again, fascinating indeed. Let's keep going. All right, another fascinating uh, picture again, Africa, the birthplace of humanity. This photograph taken in uh, uh, Toli, Tanzania in East Africa, the East African nation of Tanzania, uh, petrified footprints of two Austral Pythocenes walking side by side approximately 3.2, 3.3 million years ago. And look at those footprints. They look a lot like a modern human. If you know anything about an ape's foot, an ape's foot looks a lot like her hand. It has an opposable th uh, thumb um, as a big toe. These creatures did not. So again, they stood up, they walked. And again, just imagine this, right? There's a couple uh, walking side by side um, along a, a creek, which uh, petrified, and then we now have their footprints. Absolutely fascinating. Let's just keep going. All right, here we go. All right. Again, to be human is to be African. About 30 years ago, uh, scientists uh, posited a theory that's now called the, uh, the mitochondrial E, or out of Africa theory. And we'll talk a bit more about the out of Africa theory uh, momentarily. But basically, so, so now we have just fast forwarded through uh, uh, human history. We've gone from about 7 million years ago. Now we're about 200,000, 150,000 years ago. Modern humans, us, as in modern humans, we first emerged in Africa, in Eastern and Southern Africa, approximately 200,000 years ago. So again, people like us have been walking on the planet for 200,000 years. Most of human history has occurred on the continent of Africa. So, but here we go with the mitochondrial leave, and I dig this. All right, what scientists believe is that every single human being on the planet is related to one African woman who lived approximately 150, 175,000 years ago in East Africa. And how do they, how did they make these conclusions? They looked at her mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondria, the, the engine block of the cell. Uh, the mitochondria DNA is passed along only on the mother's side. And essentially, all humans' mitochondrial DNA is identical, which led scientists to believe that we, if we all have identical mitochondrial DNA, that we all descended from one common ancestor who, who lived approximately 150 to 175,000 years ago in Africa. So in many respects, the Bible is right. In terms of Adam and Eve, uh, we have a black Adam and Eve. In fact, there was also a mitochondrial, uh, uh, oh, and to be clear, the mitochondrial Eve, she was not the first human. She was not the first modern human, but Keep in mind that early humans, there were only a few thousand of us around for a very long time, but it was from her ancestors from, from whom we all descend. So as I often say in the classroom, the sister had some really good genes. All right. Indeed. All right. I'm digging this. Too bad that we can't be in person, but perhaps next year. All right. The out of Africa theory. All right. So again, modern humans, we emerged out of Africa uh, around 200,000 years ago. And our first ancestors began walking out of Africa at least 90,000 years ago. I think what's most fascinating about human history is that for most of human history, there were multiple humanoid creatures, species, walking around simultaneously. So if you can see, you see Homo sapiens, you see Homo neanderthal, and you see Homo erectus. Uh, all these species have first, first emerged, first evolved out of Africa. Our ancestors, of course, walked out, uh, or rather Africans, first walked out of the continent approximately 90,000 years ago, moved into modern day Saudi Arabia, moved into uh, Asia, 
Australia, and then really not, and then into Europe, only about 40,000 years ago, perhaps 30, 35,000 years ago into North America. All right. All right. This might surprise you. All right. What did the first modern humans look like in Europe? This is what they look like. Can't everybody see? Do I get a thumbs up there? Everybody can see, right? Thank you. All right. Didn't make sure that we're on the same page. So the, the image on the left is a bust of a of a of uh, a, a, a bones of a of uh, skeletal remains of a gentleman who lived approximately 37,000 years ago uh, in modern day Romania. So, and then, and unfortunately, I don't think we have the time, but uh, I put in I put in a chat uh, a really interesting link to uh, the person on the right who has been referred to as Cheddar Man. Uh, he lived about, uh, was about, uh, was it 10,000 uh, years ago or so in modern day Britain. Um, he, he, uh, he and his, uh, his uh, a close, his family is akin were the first modern uh, Britons. And as you see, they had dark skin, but blue eyes. And what scientists Think, and this is fascinating is that white skin perhaps is only perhaps only 10,000 12,000 years old it was uh, a genetic adaptation evolutionary change and his blue eyes uh, due to the OCA2 gene which uh, 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 deals with eye color again most humans have have dark have brown eyes uh, so again you had a person who today would be considered black who was who was the first modern Britain? So again, when folks say, "Oh, my family's British," "Oh, my family's Irish," "Oh, black people are new to Europe," oh no, <laughs> no. Again, the first modern humans in Af in Europe were African people. All right, let's move it up a little bit. Uh, let's move into antiquity. Egypt, Kemet, one of the foundational human civilization, a a society, a state that survived for, for more than 3,000 years along the banks of the Nile. The last I checked, the last I saw, Egypt is on the continent of Africa. It's, yes, it's in the Middle East, but it's in Africa. And if we know anything, as folks ought to know, Egypt, of course, actually was a colony of Ethiopia. And its roots, historically, were always not so much to the north, but indeed to the south. So when you see Cleopatra, you know, going back, you know, folks who might be you know, older than fit, well, I don't want to date anybody or myself, but if you all saw the Liz Taylor movie and the Cleopatra and the blue eyes and all that, that's a bunch of nonsense. But again, it speaks to the way in which white supremacy, right, has reinvented the past. If you can, if you can argue or frame black people as a people without history that helps to rationalize and justify the oppression and subjugation of african descended people and again if we went if we went back in time we went to the ancient world and said to the ancient greeks say you know black people egyptians africans they're backwards the greeks would have been what are you talking about each egypt is a center of learning Herodotus, pythagoras all y'all who you know math you know, learned about the Pythagorean uh, theory and all that, you know, with math and all that stuff. I'm not good in math, so, you know, I botched that, right? But all those folks, right, where did they study? They studied in Egypt. Why? Because Egypt was a cent was the center of learning. And, and look at that sphinx. As I always say, look at those cheeks, right? Look at that African person looking at you, right? Oh, my goodness. My, my, my. Let's just keep talking since and keep going since times of the essence. When we talk about Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you cannot talk about these faiths without talking about the centrality of Africa. Africa was critical to all to, to birthing all of those faiths. Of course, the Bible, both the New and Old Testament, full of references to Ethiopia, to Egypt what have you of course jesus after his family got got chased down got chased right where did jesus grow up he grew up in egypt right uh, uh of course ethiopia is home to uh not only one of the oldest christian churches on the planet but also of course home to uh, some of the oldest practicing jews on the planet 
And then, of course, with Islam. Of course, Islam. Again, you can't talk about Islam without talking about Africa. You can't talk about Africa without talking about Islam. That, that Islam's rapid spread out of, out of Saudi Arabia, or modern day Saudi Arabia, moving into, uh, moving into Africa, moving into Egypt, and of course, across the Maghrib, the Western land, and of course, into Spain. And Spain, of course, would be a center from 711 to 1492, a very important year, 711 to 1492, Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula was under the rule of Moors, under the rule of, of North African Muslims, that Spain was a center of knowledge, a center of knowledge production, cultural pluralism, an exciting place where Muslims Jews and Christians coexisted, and again, a center of learning and technological innovation. And again, that year 1492, so again, for centuries, uh, Europeans attempted to, to kick out, to defeat uh, Moors, uh, the Islamic presence, and of course, the Islamic presence was critical to helping people that we now call Europeans white to begin even thinking themselves as being part of one solid group of people. But again, we cannot talk enough about the impact of, of Islam on African people and the impact of African people on Islam. All right, keep going. Um, certainly, of course, Again, Africa, this idea is a backward place. No, no, no. A place of dynamic civilization, state formations. Some of the most famous will actually go from the right to the left. Those, uh, those Western uh, Sudanese uh, states, uh, the Western Sudan, of course, uh, Sudan, of course, is an, is an Arab word, a uh, land of the blacks. Again, the, the, the the significant presence or impact, again, of Islam on the continent, of course, the Sahara Desert. And of course, if you speak Arabic, you know that Sahara in Arabic means ocean. Uh, those, th those states that you see, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, located in the Sahal. The Sahal, of course, uh, means shore in, in Arabic. Why is it called a shore? Because if you think of the Sahara as an ocean, if you've ever seen it, it's, it's like an ocean, right? And then the Sahal, the region between the, the desert and the rainforest uh, regions to the south, again, a site of dynamic states, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, a center of learning, commerce, trade, Timbuktu, uh, Cordoba and Spain, all of these places linked to a much larger world. Mansa Musa, the king of Mali, who, was, who has been regarded as one of the richest people in history when he took his Hajj to Mecca. Again, he was a good Muslim, right? He plunged the world into a recession because he brought so much gold with him, uh, right? And again, Mali, that region was critical of gold and salt uh, production that was, of course, traded to Europe. And then, and then on the left, moving uh, forward in time, Congo, the, the, the state of Congo in modern day uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, the Republic of Congo, Angola, as a, a center of learning, a, a, a dynamic a society. Um, and again, a significant portion, a significant number of people of African descent in this country and, and, and in the diaspora in South America, the Caribbean, beyond, of course, hail from Congo. So, uh, Ms. Helbert, can you give me five more minutes? Is that cool? Is that cool? Is that a thumbs up? All right, because I won't talk too much now. I mean, I, I'll keep talking all night here. All right. Certainly and without question, the Atlantic slave trade, uh, the modern day uh, uh, Atlantic plantation complex uh, marked a significant change in the history of African people, the history of the world. Just to be clear, folks, and as I would say in class, write this down, or if you were in the class, I'd say write this down. We don't wanna make the classic mistake of equating blackness with slavery. Don't forget what the root word of, sla of uh, slavery is. The root word of slavery is Slav, as in Slavic peoples, right? Because again, in the medieval world and, and, uh, and antiquity, Romans enslaved people from the Balkans, from modern day Balkans, white people, right? White people who were working the sugar plantations um, in the Eastern Mediterranean during the 12th and 13th and 14th uh, centuries. 
And of course, sugar, sugar cane is what really helped to make uh, slavery pay and which, which helps explain why uh, 10 to 15 million African peoples were brought across uh, the Atlantic in the Middle Passage, perhaps as many as some folks say as many as 100 million people. Uh, but certainly in terms of the impact that the, that the uh, slave trade had, that's not a far-fetched uh, number. Again, the catastrophic impact that slavery had not only on um, Africans who survived the Middle Passage, but on the continent itself. I don't know if anyone ever here has had the, the privilege or opportunity to travel to Africa, to travel to West Africa, to travel to Ghana, to visit Cape Coast Castle um, in Ghana, one of the three most famous uh, castles or warehouses uh, that held uh, enslaved Africans or captive Africans before they were brought to the Americas. Uh, of course, there's Cape Coast Castle in Cape Coast, Ghana, about two hours west of Accra. Uh, nearby, there's Almina Castle, which is about two, about three times bigger than this castle that you see right here. And of course, there's Gore Island in Senegal. All three of those sites are uh, regarded as United Nations World Heritage Sites. Uh, and to be clear, right, there were hundreds there were literally hundreds of these kinds of buildings constructed along the West, Central, and even East African coasts. And this is important. It's, and again, Cape Coast Castle was built explicitly. It was designed and built specifically for holding Africans to be brought to the Americas. So again, African people, the slave trade, the Atlantic plantation complex constituted the first modern world economic system. African people were the first modern industrial working class. And again, helps and that and that and that uh, the exploitation, rape, suffering of African people produced the wealth that made Europe, the US rich. Of course, I'm drawing from the work of Eric Williams. Eric Williams, his classic 1944 book, Capitalism and Slavery. Uh, Walter Rodney's uh, brilliant book, uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Um, if you're looking, oh my goodness, we keep, uh, keep talking, but you know, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I got uh, two more quick slides and we're done. So 1619, just so that we're clear, and this is a common mistake. Well, first and for foremost, again, Although we so often use that year 1619 as the start date of African American history. Now again, African American history didn't start in slavery. It didn't start in 1619. Certainly 1619 was an important, in hindsight, well, or well, not then, then and in hindsight, was an important a year in the history of black people in the world. But again, black history didn't start in slavery. But what isn't, and nor was it the, nor did uh, slavery, the Atlantic plantation complex start in 1619, started in 1440, 1441, right? And would continue into the 1860s um, and 1870s um, in the uh, Caribbean. But the point is, again, with 1619, why is it important? Again, it's the year that's, that, that, that's commonly recognized as the beginning of slavery and what, and what uh, became the, United States, 1619 was foundational to, uh, to uh, starting slavery in this country, to the foundations of uh, racial capitalism in this country, to the making of this country uh, into a white settler colonial nation, empire, again, predicated upon the enslavement of African peoples and, and the genocide of indigenous people. And again, we can't emphasize enough the way in which, uh, which the enslavement of African peoples and white supremacy, racial capitalism, gendered racial capitalism was essential, foundational to the making of the modern world. And in fact, just right quick, and I will wrap it up in 30 seconds, I promise Ms. Halpert. If you look back at this picture here, uh, Cape Coast Castle, and I'm not sure if anyone's been there, if you have, please uh, share it uh, at, when we talk in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, my mother is on uh, is in the Zoom call, so she can attest to this as well. She might chime in. That right in that hallway, that that passageway that where where Africans were led out to the shore, where there would be boats to take them out out to the uh, 
uh, ocean and and then uh, and then on to the Americas of Cuba, Jamaica, Brazil, Argentina, the United States, what have you. That there were rooms designed, rape rooms, that were used specifically for holding women and girls who resisted the uh, sexual advances of their enslavers, right? So we have to understand, and as I always emphasize in my classes, that racism, white supremacy is always gender, right? Always gender, right? And that again, like the sexual exploitation, the racist exploitation of slip is literally built into the edifice of these buildings. I mean, it's, they are they are truly sickening places. And again, what's so sickening about it is when you see these buildings, if you didn't know what they were, you think, wow, they're really architecturally something else, they're beautiful to me. But again, those buildings were designed again to, to hold and to hold African people. And then lastly, because again, the, the, the story doesn't, the story isn't over. And again, the, the, the events of this past year, uh, Black Lives Matter, of course, the, the pandemic that has devastated uh, Black people disproportionately, and, and it still hasn't hit the continent, hasn't hit Africa probably as hard as it will. But the way in which African people have resisted, the way in which African people have been at the front lines of global struggles for freedom. And I think what's particularly important in the way, the way in which Black women have always been at the forefront in leading African communities, African descended peoples for freedom. Again, going back to our very, the very start of modern, of modern humanity, everyone on the Zoom call, we are all related to an African woman, to a sister who lived 150,000 years ago. I don't care if you have blue eyes and blonde hair. I don't care if you say, my family is 100% Italian or 100% Danish or something like that. You are, and we are all African people. And, and that humans will not be free until, until African people and indeed black women as the Kambahi River collective statement, the black uh, radical feminist group of the 1970s argued that, 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 uh, until, that humans won't be free until black women, until black people are free. So at that point, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I know you can't hear all the applause, but so much great information shared in such a short period of time. We knew that it would not be enough time, but hopefully it would whet everyone's appetite to research more and to learn more about uh, our heritage. Mm -hmm. We are all connected. We want to thank Dr. Eric McDuffie. We have a few questions. Tony, will you call, will you read out the questions to uh, Dr. McDuffie and feel free to answer. And if we don't get to all the questions, we will post them on our website. Yeah, there are two questions that I'm going to combine because they're very similar. Uh, the question is, why do you feel our educational system failed to give the true picture of the African history? And is there a second question, sir, or no? Uh, well, there were two questions, but they both were asking the same thing. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, again, you know, I would get back to what, um, you know, those quotes that, 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 that I showed earlier in the uh, presentation, the, uh, just go back to that, that um, knowledge, education constitutes a key side of struggle, right? Um, and whoever controls, uh, the conversation, the discourse uh, uh, can very much uh, control or try to control public policy. Um, so again, for white supremacists then and now, um, and this is why a whole lot of white supremacists would not like th this presentation or uh, those like it when we, when we call out uh, the racist origins of this country in the modern world. But again, it's not my opinion. This is a fact, these are facts. And so again, the way in which white supremacy, not only a form of economic exploitation, but the ways in which, and perhaps Dr. Chajua will talk about this, how he argues that uh, racial oppression always, uh, uh, is, always uh, contains an, uh, a, a structural component 
and an ideological component, how, how, how they are both linked and, and how both inform the other. So again, um, you know, for example, the way in which President Trump went after the 1619 project, the way in which they went after the sister down in North Carolina, uh, the professor, who, who was uh, at, the, uh, at the front lines of the 1619 Project and, and how the uh, University of North Carolina denied her tenure, again, speaks to the way in which um, knowledge is truly about power and uh, why education constitutes one, not the only site, but constitutes an important side of struggle. So thank you for the question. We have a second question. The question is, what popular trades were in Africa? What popular trades? Correct. Okay. Uh, well, certainly, um, and, you know, I don't want to compare, say what, everything that existed in uh, Europe um, existed in Africa. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, again, Africa was foundational for, you know, going back in early uh, human history in terms of bronze and iron making, um, uh, architecture, of course, the, the, the pyramids, not only in Ethiopia, but in, uh, I'm sorry, not only in Egypt, but in Nubia, uh, modern day, present day Sudan, present day uh, Ethiopia. Um, so, uh, you know, again, unfortunately, we have all been taught or uh, that Africa was a place without history, a place without culture, a place without learning, a place without technology. And we should really appreciate, again, um, Africa as really the, uh, a key birthplace of science and mathematics. And again, Pythagoras, right? The Greek, you know, we talk about the Pythagorean theory, or whatever, I guess it's what, 90 degree triangles, all that kind of stuff. Again, I'm not good in math, right? But where did he study? He studied, he studied in Egypt and was, was, quite, was quite open about it. Absolutely. So thank you for the question. Okay. And that actually concludes the questions, but there's countless compliments and words of appreciation about the presentation here. Oh, thank you. And, well, and thank, go ahead. Well, you know, again, I mean, we, I mean, I don't want to hijack the program, but we still have at least uh, 10 more minutes. So uh, I'm sure folks have questions. And uh, I know I have some friends and colleagues out there. Uh, Brother Bryce, uh, Dr. Henson, I don't know if you have a comment or, or anything that you'd like to add, or my mom, Mary McDuffie, I don't know if uh, you'd like to add. But oh, yeah, as, as I said in, cl in class, you know, I go the distance. So we aren't going to leave early. <laughs> we do want to say that if if we don't take anything from this presentation, I hope that we all will remember that uh, Black people's lives did not start with slavery. And that's why it was so important for us as we began this week-long uh, education of Black history to acknowledge our birthplace and to even, as you shared, the birthplace of humanity is Africa. And when you look at the DNA, the science uh, proves the facts to be true. And so we do appreciate uh, that revelation for some, for others, it's not news, but we know even today in our educational system, there are debates about what information to include in our history. And we're trying to get the truth about black history included in every aspect of our District 87, Unit 5. Uh, I know we all know all the struggles that are currently existing. And uh, I'm glad you did share at the very beginning that it's not just justice uh, denied, but it is delayed, which means there is hope. There is something that we can do about that. Uh, I will let you continue with some additional comments and then we will close with some uh, announcements about the upcoming week. You have closing comments you'd like to share with us? Well, if there aren't any more comments, what I could do is I could show that very short video. It's only about maybe a minute or so long. Okay. Is that okay, Ms. Albert? So, yes. yeah, so I'll stop. I will uh, show the video about Cheddar Man. Uh, yes. It's quite interesting. And let's see what happens. Okay, just bear with me here right quick. 
and uh, had it queued up. And uh, oh, I should be here. All right, I think you all are in store for uh, an interesting go. Here we go. Like in Western Europe and Britain, 10,000 expected. One, two. This is what people look like in Western Europe and Britain 10,000 years ago, not what we would have expected. One, two, three, come on. <laughs> In, in museums, reconstructions, they look a bit like this guy has a, a spark to him. I'm Chris Stringer, I'm a research leader in human origins at the Natural History Museum in London and I'm holding here this wonderful reconstructed head of Cheddar Man and I've been studying the skeleton of Cheddar Man for some 40 years or so and now with DNA technology we've got the whole genome of Cheddar Man and here we've got a scientific reconstruction of what he looked like. Uh, we've got his hair form, his skin, his blue eyes and that dark skin colour, that combination really striking and getting out of here information about his biology, the fact that for example he couldn't digest milk uh, because that came in with the advent of farming after the time of Cheddar Man. So we're getting his whole biology, how he relates to people in Europe at the time and how he relates to people in Britain now. All right, and it's such a fascinating video. Did I assume everyone could hear it, right? Yes. Okay, great. But you know, um, the one thing, as, as I say to my kids, um, I mean, it's great that you have all those uh, Britons, those uh, white uh, scientists doing this work, but I want to see more black people doing this kind of work. Um, I want to see more African people uh, digging in afar um, in Ethiopia, uh, doing this uh, paleo uh, anthropology. Uh, or rather, archaeological uh, both. Um, again, there's so many. I mean, it's the 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 history of African people is so rich and so exciting and so dynamic. And ultimately, um, it, it's African people who need, who who need to be at the front the forefront in telling our stories. And that's not to say again, non-black people can't be a part of this, of course. But definitely, we need African people. Um, at front and center um, um, in doing this work. Thank you so much. And we hope that the information that everyone has seen will encourage our children and our youth to explore. A lot of times uh, people don't know about the opportunities that are available to them and that they can.